let's maybe take it a little higher level um so so we don't you know bore the audience with all our developer talk but but we're now transitioning and we're seeing here and i have the ir news website pulled up we've seen several substantial partnerships coming out uh with different companies in different specific industries yep and i shot a couple different videos that are coming out here soon on this and i thought it was very interesting that in 2021 we saw them build out on the website their big claim of 40 different industries that they support now it's 50 um they outline them in the website you guys i encourage you to go look at it uh a lot of them are in critical infrastructure which is is key right especially for our country and uh for um really you know for a security perspective you want your critical infrastructure for a security first company uh, if they're able to add value to our critical infrastructure as a company and our Western allies, that's, that's huge um, because cyber warfare is happening. Yep. And we're seeing them, though, brand and modularize Foundry um, to solve specific use cases and learning about the businesses or industries so that way it can be replicable to yep. other companies and almost building platforms. Yep. So maybe you can explain first how, because I'm doing a lot of talking here and you're the guest <laughs> um, and they want to hear you talk anyways, uh, is Skywise is a great example of a platform or module that now is adopted across 130 uh, airlines and it's pretty much the, the standard for the airline industry. What have you taken away in other industries that they're doing? Uh, you know, we just offline, we were talking about Trinfigura. Uh, with supply chain and carbon emissions. We can talk about Stellantis. T tell me your thought process here because I think we had an interesting dialogue about this offline. So yeah, the, the strategy makes a lot of sense once you understand um, how Foundry changes the SaaS paradigm. So like typical SaaS is you have a REST API or a set of REST APIs that you invoke and you'll get a you'll you'll basically be transferring data from your org over to this other org, and then they have a GUI that sits on top of it and like helps you understand it or push it around. Basically, every SaaS product does that, whether it's Bamboo HR or whether it's Google Analytics or whether it's some other thing. All that's happening is data is moving through really dumb pipes through a REST API, and there's some app somewhere that transforms it, molds it, does some transaction processing with it, and and gives you some visualization of the data. You know, that's it. That's all SaaS really does, and what Palantir did was say, let's freaking stop doing that because it creates innumerable data silos. Mm -hmm. It creates hundreds of offerings that often overlap. And it's actually hard for you to do anything meaningful at the integration layer because the Bingo. integration layer is REST. You know, it's the API. Bingo. Layer, right? So, so, so yeah. hold on, we're talking language that not everyone, your, your normal, you know, not technology person, and maybe they're interested in investing in Palantir. The data has to be usable to make decisions. What you're yep. trying to do with data is get outcomes. And what you just said there is 70% of the world uses SaaS and we're all just doing open APIs, which just are plugins that allow you to take your data and bring it into another product, another pane yep. of glass and, and, and see it and try yep. to use it, try to manipulate it. But what you're saying now, you can expand on. Yeah, they're actually and, well, and also the, the outgrowth of the shitty user experience that results from that because you're often drop jumping through seven different products to get one sliver of insight. You know, and so it's like, who here has to log in like five times a day through Okta? You know, like who here has yeah, <laughs> like that experience is terrible. Yeah. But also that your data now is owned by this other company, right? So like, why is it that I have to pay extra to get my data out of there once I put it in there? You know, like so that's usually, you know, falls under enterprise licensing to, yep. to get the data out. Getting the data in is usually free. Getting the data out is actually like a six figure deal in a lot of most cases, you know? So like, so anyway, there's, there's that side effect of the way things operate today. So what Palantir did is they said, you know what, let's bring the apps to the data, right? And so what they did is they created this system where you can actually build full blown applications from data transformation to visual UI, like a, what, what a, the equivalent of what a software engineering team can build. And you can package those as templates and then ship them to other Foundry users. So like I can build a full blown thing like Hyper Auto, right? And I can build it inside Foundry. And if the feature doesn't exist, the Palantir core team adds it. But like a good example of this is like they built Skywise in Foundry. 
Yep. Right? They built it with the low code tools in Foundry. Yep. And when I, when I say like Palantir eats their own dog food, like they're building huge multi-million dollar software applications inside Foundry using the same tools that you'll have access to. So yeah, you can absolutely displace every SaaS product on the market, bring the app to the data. And the cool thing about that is that because Foundry is a big data OS, no matter what app you build in there, the data now is accessible, right? So it's like, you can understand it, but now- what's you don't have the to go seven panes of glass. Yeah, exactly. But then like, it's the strategy starts to make sense to you when you go, oh, well, if they just get, if they have one archetype, like one customer who is the prototype for an industry, and they solve that architecture and they package it up as an archetype, you now have every other person who talks about entities the same way, like does business the same way as a locked in gotta be customer. <laughs> and then when you layer in on top this idea that Foundry instances can talk to each other, they can share data without replication, they can do these kind of really crazy ways in which the apps, the data does not need to live in your Foundry instance in order to analyze it. Then you have this idea that, holy shit, not only are all those customers gonna benefit from all the, the apps I built in here and I can ship to them, they can now connect data to each other, right? So like, I don't even have to have the data in my Foundry instance to take advantage of an archetype. So That's are you a bit speculative because I haven't played with that feature, but I've heard about it, you know? Yeah, and I've heard about this too. I, I read it through the supply chain management platform that they're building out with Trinfigura. Yep. Basically, the way I understand it is they can use those foundry archetypes and connect into things like Snowflake to uh, your proprietary apps, or whatever, and analyze that data and make use of value, uh, even though if it doesn't live inside of foundry. So now big you- time, Big time. But it's, it's also like, there's two layers to it. It's like what they can do with foundry's um, software defined data integrations that are part of the archetypes is just get the raw source data that's sitting in either an ERP system, a system like Snowflake, like a, a data yeah. warehouse, S3, like raw data. And based on the analysis that the intelligence that they've built does, it determines what kind of data it is, but then it'll produce all of the data pipelines and the ontology that's associated with that. So like a lot of what a data analyst does is put data, raw source data into like this meaningful structure in which you can right. actually get value out of it. But they've got software that does that were we talking about offline and I was wondering yeah. how long does that take to get all that data into the foundry platform if there's an archetype that stays zero you know like it's just the processing time to actually bring the data in that, there's that a timeline to build the archetype right well there's a lot of existing ones though you know so like every partnership they have has an associated archetype with it you're, you're never starting from ground zero you're starting, you're never really starting from ground zero. yeah exactly that's so, so the more, and this is now think of the network effects of that, right? Like the more people that create archetypes and the more people that use Foundry, the more value that build this platform. I'm people. getting excited here. I just want to say, people, listen, <laughs> enterprise, small business, listen, time, reduce your time to get value. That is what we're yeah. doing in business. And what this is doing for the developer community, the, the, these, these software, because at the end of the day, software is trying to drive an outcome, right? Like the, yeah. we always hear software is eating the world. Yeah. Maybe you can say now microservice, whatever. You're trying to get faster time to value, to have a competitive edge and drive a great yeah. customer experience. And starting not from ground zero and starting with a framework in place that's relevant to my industry and yeah. what I'm used to is game changing. Yeah. And if I understand it right, with Skywise, it was actually built, like Airbus created apps on Foundry to make their own program calling it Skywise. That's exactly right. Yeah. And they, it's, their, it's their baby. It's just the OS was Foundry. I mean, uh, Palantir helped a lot. You know? Right, right. I'm not discrediting yeah. Palantir, but, but it's, you can build your company's, like Weijo. Yeah, there is, there is literally nothing you can't build, in my opinion. It's like the equivalent of a Turing complete programming language, but it's like, it's a, it's, all, it's a set of tools that solves every app you'd want to build, every category problem in an app yeah, like, you want to address. If I'm and, a developer. Visual tools, right? With like visual drag and drop tools as opposed to having to write code, you know. If, if, if I'm a developer, why wouldn't I want to build on that? I They do. I mean, once people understand it, they do. Uh, every developer wants to be on there, in my opinion. There's, some get intimidated. Some some have arguments over the layout of the UI or like, oh, I don't want to work on an online ID. I'd prefer to work offline, which they support as well. Like there's little disagreements in there, but everyone gets excited once they see the bit, once they understand the amount of value they can ship and the wheels start turning and they go, oh, 
all those things that were hard and slowing me down last year, they all become easy. And, and then I can start shipping the value that my boss wants to see, you know, like, and, and there isn't the, like the hardest thing about foundry is getting the data in initially. Cause I was telling you, it's kind of like a security first yep. platform, uh, but then everything else downstream is so damn easy. And, and that's where like people who are normally stuck with the integration nightmares of like gluing together 15 tools to do something like this. They get excited because they're like, oh man, like I don't need to deal with 15 or 20 of these other tools. You know, I can drop those. I mean, not have to that anymore. Team, uh, or an application team, you can go back and say, look, I can save yeah. you this amount of money if you give me this money here to adopt this platform. Yeah, they're way happier with the headaches you're saving them. You know? Yeah. Like, it's never money. mind the money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's well, that's true. But at the end of the day, I think the uh, the CFO and the CIO and CEO care oh, about them, right? Yeah. But there's, there's um, another layer to the sharing. So like, uh, just understand that like, uh, there's that archetype feature and there's that data modeling benefit along with along with the low code, no code tools. But the sharing capabilities are, this, businesses today still largely operate in a siloed model. Manufacturing that depends on su supply chain does not, and they have like a consortium. Sure. But those consortiums are painful to operate. There, there isn't necessarily a first party integration across all systems to keep them in sync. And what's cool about Foundry is again, you can build these archetypes and template solutions, but the data doesn't need to live in your organization alone. And it's not REST APIs necessarily. I mean, there's REST in the middle of it, but what's cool is that I can build an archetype, but you're, you can reference another Foundry instance as a data source, right? So if I'm in a consortium model and I have like maybe one part of the supply chain in my org, I can now use Foundry holistically for everything, but I can access your data too you know, and I can make changes against your data too, as I'm doing things, if I have the permissions to, right? So that, even and this- they don't own Foundry? What's that? Even if they don't own Foundry for that- No, no, they have to be in Foundry. Like okay, you're right. in Foundry and you have to say hyper auto, hyper auto as your archetype, but maybe all the data isn't in your org. Maybe some of the data is in this other org, right? But now and that I have it, I can bring, oh. If both people are running Foundry, now you can start connecting those things. So you have apps that run across organizations. Right. Are unifying probably. markets. That's what you're doing. Yeah. Is you're unifying. You're building platforms that are yeah. are. Then they will uh, own every industry vertical. Yeah. You know, like like vertical. like what I get really excited about, and then I start piecing this together, is compliance. Yeah. Yeah. You have to follow certain compliances, especially if you're in a federal government or regulated critical infrastructure organization. Yeah. Uh, even some commercial. I mean, you have you have PCI compliance. You have NIST. You have. Yeah uh FERPA I mean there's so many uh compliances so then you start building with this security first model yeah. and you're saying hey I can follow all these frameworks and guardrails and I can deliver time to value quickly and, and, and yep. it's in a language I understand yep. um so maybe expand on that on or I can either way it, of some of these different deals and why they're so meaningful because they, they've gone after some different industries and, and I think we're going to see these turn into some different platforms similar to Skywinds. I, I mean, I think Hyundai Heavy Industries is a really good prototype to look at where there's clearly a huge network of suppliers, right? There's a huge labor force. You have, I think it's thousands of companies that interoperate amongst that network. You know, it's, it's pretty mental. Maybe it's hundreds. I think it's hundreds. So they've got hundreds of companies that interoperate in there. And because, again, like really the 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 core of Foundry is defining what we call the domain model, which is like the data model that describes the, the real things in the real world that you interact with. And it also describes their behaviors like and how they interact. So like if I perturb this element over here in the supply chain and it goes away, what happens downstream of that, you know, kind of question. Is that just the AI that knows that? Like it just- there's, there's more heuristic programming where you're defining functions and rules, but you can incorporate artificial intelligence to measure like the magnitude of effect of like changes and incorporate that in there. Um, but but it, what's cool about that and understanding Hyundai Heavy Industries where you have hundreds of people that are working together in a large supply chain is like, if, if you can actually describe the data model correctly and build the digital twin for them, everyone can use that digital twin. You know, like every single person within who works in that industry now has a shareable digital twin of what their work actually looks like in the real world. And if you actually hook them all up on Foundry, now they can actually move at the speed of the data stream. They're all seeing the same effects as to their actions and they can take, they can mitigate those. They can take, you know, implement remediation strategies. They can run one if scenario, what if scenarios together, but they can do that together in a way that like you can't really do today, you know? So like for instance, okay, 
they build out Hyundai. They could replicate that framework and that archetype, and you could have that for Toyota. You could have that for Ford, whoever. And but think data first. It's like cars. You know, it's like I can do it for cars. Right. But think like shit. Yeah. You know, yeah exactly. Cars. They do. Hyundai does a lot more than just cars. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. What you're doing though is you're giving them a framework to build off of, yep. customized to their liking. And then they can communicate in if it's in a consortium model or a platform model where I'm sure a lot of car places that are still not EVs have to order parts from the same places yep. and they work with the same contractors, et cetera. It, you start seeing efficiencies like what what Alex Carp would say is alpha, right? You're getting yeah, that's alpha. exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. You but it's it's more meta than that, in that like the first company to build it is producing the the sort of digital representation of the business entities and the real world entities, you know? And that's the foundational thing that's inside Foundry. The, the ontology is the heart of Foundry, you know? And so when they do these partnerships, what I love is when I see a company like Hyundai Heavy Industries, it's like, oh yeah, you can model every entity in that process with them. Mm -hmm. Not some supplier over here, you know? You you actually are at the heart of everything. And, and as they acquire these customers and build these partnerships, if they are at the heart of an industry where they can effectively model the whole thing, that provides the springboard for ever for like huge, huge growth and network effects as more people use the system. And that's and now the digital, the digital play in the industry is sort of mapped, you know. We were talking about that offline was the, yeah. the network effects. It was yeah. like a light bulb clay, like the networking effects is massive. Oh, it's huge. Um yeah. I'm reading the more people that are on it and use it together, especially in an industry consortium model the more value is going to be generated for sure. And then it's harder to walk away because, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, if you're- Why would you ever though? Like, why would you ever want to go back to the old way? You know? Well, I mean, look at the 130 airlines that use Skywise, right? Yeah. Like no yeah. one's walking away from, they're not going to be the, the yeah. redheaded stepchild that says, no, nah, I'm too good for that. And the people that operate on it like it, you know, the, the yeah. net from, from what I hear from the people who have used it actually like it, you know. And to your yeah. point with even Skywise, those archetypes and- as long as the customer has Foundry, they're making those communications to contractors, to other people. So yep. it's really completing the full life cycle of everything that's going on within that, that organization or that industry. Yep. Um, so it, it, it's consequently making everyone better, right? Absolutely. I mean, I, I always say like it's a 10Xer for your workforce, yep. you know, like, it, <laughs> like imagine you could take the same skills everyone has. And the only thing you do, the only thing you change is implement this platform and you can 10 X those, the productivity of those people. Like, why would you not do that? You know, like it's so I'm going to.